Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. Before we begin, just a few things to note. We are recording today's webinar, so we'll get that out to you as soon as we can this week. And if there are any questions during the webinar, please drop them in the Q&A section, and we'll answer them live at the end. Rob and Aaron, thanks for joining us today. All right. Well, hey, everybody. It's uh, good to get to talk with you today. Um, we're going to jump in and, and talk talk about like what we did, why we did it, all that good stuff. To start off with, um, I'm Rob Reck. I'm the Chief Trust Officer at Red Canary. Aaron, you want to go ahead? Good morning. I'm Aaron Tickett, the Director of Corporate Security here at Red Canary. Awesome. Well, mostly Aaron's going to be talking today, but I figured I'd give a little bit of an intro and explain you know, how we even got here. So, you know, we, both Aaron and I have been at Red Canary for about a year. And um, as we, as we got digging into our security program and, and building out new capabilities, um, one of the things I really wanted to do is make sure we understood, you know, what are the threats that are, that are most relevant to us? And, and then wh what do you do about it, right? Like once you know that, that these are the, the types of threats that are most likely to impact you. Uh, are there certain controls that we need to have in place that we don't have today? Is there a certain level of maturity for some of those controls that's more important? Um, so I asked Aaron to to you know start doing a threat model, and and I, I'll tell you he he kind of blew me away with the, the, how far he went to do this, and um, we wanted to share it with you guys what what we've learned through this process. Um, so I'm excited to hand it to Aaron and let him talk through his methodology, and then near the end we'll have a chance to answer any questions that he doesn't get into. Go ahead, Aaron. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. Uh, so today we'll kind of talk through the methodology and how I approached uh, the task at hand of creating a threat model for Red Canary um, as a new employee. So we did this last year when I was fairly new. My team was fairly new at Red Canary. Uh, so we'll just walk through the methodology and I'll take the approach on how you can take this same type of methodology for your organization. So um, I've broken it into two sections. One is actually creating the threat model for the enterprise. Um, and then the second piece is mapping to MITRE attack. Um, I had additional goals as we created the threat model to make sure that what we were doing uh, was something that we could operationalize. So ensuring that we could measure coverage for the different threats and really use this to drive prioritization um, of what the corporate security team at Red Canary should be doing. So we'll jump right in. Um, so as we look to create the threat model, um, this is the approach we took. First, I looked at selecting a framework, discovering and classifying assets, kind of determining the overall attack surface for the enterprise. Uh, then we got into some of the fun things of actually defining the threat actors for the enterprise, uh, doing a quick risk assessment, um, and then we started using it. So there are a lot of different frameworks for threat models out in the market today. There's Stride, there's Pasta, there's security cards, NIST, MITRE ATT&CK. Um, one of the particular challenges with defining a threat model for Red Canary as an enterprise, as a company, is most of the threat model modeling frameworks that are out there today, um, they're designed from an application type perspective. So it would be great if I was threat modeling um, the Red Canary platform itself, but trying to an establish a threat model for the entire company, most of them didn't work very well. Um, there is, um, if you've ever read NIST 830R1, which I highly suggest if you need to uh, fall asleep at night, it's a very long and very dry framework, but baked into the appendix of NIST 830R1, there is a very robust, um, process for establishing a threat model and defining threat actors for an organization. Uh, MITRE ATT&CK is wonderful. Uh, MITRE tracks all the TTPs for different threat actors based on real world things that they've observed. Um, the challenge I have with just using MITRE ATT&CK is it was very difficult for me to apply it across the enterprise um, in and of itself. It was too specific. So the approach I decided to take here is using NIST 830R1 to generate the threat model for the enterprise and then mapping it to MITRE ATT&CK for the different threat actors. Uh, so we had a very actionable, uh, monitorable um, threat model. So once we picked those two frameworks, the first thing that in my opinion that you have to do is 
discover what assets your company has. Um, I'm going to say this is going to be the most challenging piece of the entire project. Um, so being a new, new uh, employee at Red Canary, um, I think I had been here a week, maybe a week and a half when I started doing asset discovery. This is the process I took. I looked at our existing, existing asset management tooling. Um, I went out and talked to people. I made friends um, trying to find any assets that we didn't have formally defined. Um, making friends with your accounting and finance department is great here. Figure out who your organization is paying. Um, find those vendors, find that shadow IT, find those SaaS applications and start documenting them. Go talk to your friends in IT. Um, they should have access tickets and some sort of role-based access controls for onboarding employees. Uh, start parsing through that data to see what systems your company has. And of course, governance, risk, and compliance. Your governance, risk, and compliance team may have risks um, or BCPDR exercises associated with different systems that your company has too. So this is the approach that I took to defining what assets Red Canary has. And really it comes down to what makes your business run? Um, how do you make money? What assets do you have that a threat actor, if they compromise the, the CIA, the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of that asset, could they monetize it? What might somebody want to harm or steal um, to make money? And then additionally, data classification. Through this process, as you're working through the assets, um, now is the time I strongly recommend starting to classify the assets and the systems based on the criticality and the data they hold. So if you have a data classification policy, um, now is a wonderful time as you're doing asset discovery to really start digging in and classifying how critical those assets are. And this is just an example of how I took um, and really started bundling and summarizing um, assets so it could be consumed inside of an enterprise level threat model. Uh, one of the specific challenges are um, for anybody who's done asset management, it's hard and you very quickly get a lot of data. So, and you'll see here, in a couple minutes when we map this to MITRE, why it's very important to have this in a very high level and consumable fashion, because we'll get down into details later. Uh, that being said, you do want an easy way to draw lines back from uh, your on-premise servers to the criticality of those systems. So once I've defined and worked through asset management, the next step was really to start defining the attack surface uh, for the enterprise itself. This is another one that the biggest challenge is going to be to stay high level um, as we're going to let MITRE attack down the road, drive a lot of our specificity um, in the details. But at this point, we want to stay high level. So start to think through um, what could somebody attack um, or what could a threat actor attack in order to complete their objectives. I think of employees, I think of desktops, laptops, offices, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these things will be unique to your organization, but this is another one that it's very important at this point of the threat model to keep these relatively high level. Okay, now we're to the fun part. So we've done a whole bunch of work and out of that work, um, and I'll show it in a second or a few minutes, um, we'll have a lot of data as far as what assets we have as a company, the potential attack surface. Now comes the fun part. So now's the time to start defining the threat actors for your company. So before you start, a couple things you need to know. Um, to just know if somebody could be interested in attacking you. Uh, what industry do you work in? What industry and vertical is your company in? Are you a technology company? Um, are you a cryptocurrency company? Are you in financial? Are you in healthcare? And then that list of assets that you have gets to be important as well uh, because different threat actors are interested in different things. OK. 
okay, research. This was the part I really enjoyed. Um, so there is a ton of research being put out in the market today um, on who the threat actors are, what comp types of companies they're interested in, what kind of assets they're interested in, and then high level attack surfaces. Um, of course, the Red Canary Threat Detection Report is great. Uh, Microsoft, CrowdStrike, um, the government, tons of information out there to start consuming um, and really boiling down who could be a threat actor for your company. Um, and the important thing to keep in mind here is, once again, it's really easy. Some of these reports are very detailed and very long is really do a high level just summary as you read and skim um, to see who might be interested in your company based on the assets you have in your industry. Um, I will say as you move through it, uh, one of the biggest challenge in researching the different threat actors that might be interested in your company um, is just the lack of standardization across the industry as we talk about different threat actors. Um, for instance, um, if we're talking about a state actor such as China, um, Microsoft has one reference and name for the China threat actors. Uh, CrowdStrike has another. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security might have another. So it's very important as you're reading and skimming um, to keep all of that straight and document as you go. So down the road, uh, when APT 41 comes up, as you're mo doing proactive monitoring downstream, you understand where that goes back to as far as the threat actors for your organization. The other piece, as you're researching the threat actors, NIST is very robust um, and it has different capabilities um, or capabilities, uh, dimensions, if you will, for each of the threat actors that I thought it was interesting to capture. Um, and all of this in the NIST framework has uh, both qualitative and quantitative uh, metrics that you can tie back to the threat actor. For instance, capabilities. Is the actor sophisticated? Are they well-resourced? Um, intent, are they, does the threat actor traditionally try to harm a company? Are they just trying to steal information? Um, how, how targeted is the threat actor, generally speaking? Um, is it something the threat actor would try to compromise Red Canary specifically? Um, or is the threat actor just trying to target someone uh, inside of my vertical? Or are they just after a very specific type of asset like cryptocurrency? And so these are the other things as you're doing that research. I'm gonna put a bunch of this together and I'm happy to share it with anybody who's interested. Um, but these are the things that as you're doing your research, it's interesting to just keep an eye on and then document as you go. So as I worked through documenting threat actors for Red Canary, this is how my mind kind of works on how I bucketed the different classifications of threat actors. Um, so I think through state actors, um, generally speaking, very sophisticated, China, Russia, North Korea, other, um, and your mileage may vary. It's a decision your organization and your security team has to make, whether it's worthwhile separating, separating out if China and Russia are in your threat model, if it's worthwhile breaking them out separately or combining. Those are the types of, uh, of decisions you'll have to make at this point. Um, of course, I always break cyber criminals out um, into their own bucket, even though any of these different classifications could be and probably are cyber criminals of some sort. I think it's personally interesting to bucket them together. Um, and then I always have in threat models that I've done historically, um, insiders, either adversarial, somebody who is intentionally trying to harm your company um, or non-adversarial users or admins um, just being careless or making mistakes. Oh, but these are just some examples um, that might end up in your threat model. Okay, so at this point, uh, corporate security team at Red Canary, we have done a whole bunch of research and we had just a pile of data. Uh, so that's where we started to put it together into a threat model based on the framework in NIST 830R1. Said a lot of words, let's see how to actually use it. Um, 
So I was reading over the weekend and I happened to see this come across Twitter. Um, so apparently there was an attack against Coinbase um, a couple weeks back, maybe over the weekend. Um, and they did a really nice Intel write up. Uh, there was a BGP hijacking attack and the threat actors were able to steal about $235,000 worth of cryptocurrencies. Uh, to me, as a former networking engineer and somebody who finds cryptocurrencies interesting, this was very interesting to me personally. But the question starts to become in my job here at Red Canary, is this something my team should be prioritizing this week um, to see if this is something we need to be working on? So right now, hopefully everybody can see my big spreadsheet, uh, which is an example enterprise threat model based on uh, NIST 830R1. So you can see, um, if we go back a couple slides, for each column, I have my, my threat actors defined um, with other names, depending on which report you're reading, that the state actor of China might be, uh, the normal goals and motivations for those threat actors, common verticals they've targeted, um, and other, the other metadata that we've chatted about for the different threat actors. So as we think of the example that I just had for my reading of Twitter over the weekend, um, once you have this defined, it gets fairly easy to search uh, the threat model itself for cryptocurrencies, because that is an asset that I defined. Um, so generally speaking, the state actor, uh, North Korea, generally speaking, targets technology companies um, specifically cryptocurrency startups, and they're very interested in both uh, financial gain and specifically stealing cryptocurrencies. So looking at the threat model here, um, as I have it highlighted, I have this wonderful little column target match, and that is where I've defined, this is a threat actor that we did research on, but it is not specifically interesting to my company. So I can say, based on that example, uh, that is not something my team would spend time on, just knowing um, cryptocurrencies, we don't have any. And generally speaking, North Korea doesn't target uh, a company like ours. So let's say for something a little bit more interesting, let's say Rob said, hey, Aaron, I'm extremely concerned um, about China. Um, we know that China, the state actor, they are on the Red Canary threat model uh, for various reasons. Um, what coverage do we have if China did launch an attack at Red Canary? And this is the type of measurability I wanted to get to on the backside of this threat model. So that's where we've created the threat model we have the different threat actors established their different uh, metadata with them, what type of assets they might attack, the attack surface. So now we can map it through to MITRE ATT&CK. So if you don't know, MITRE ATT&CK, um, it's a globally accessible knowledge base of different TTPs or threat actors based on real world observations. So these are real attacks that have been observed across the world. Um, and it gives your security team the ability to really drill in, not only to see what the different attacks are, but how to, uh, how to mitigate the different attacks, which is awesome. The challenge with MITRE ATT&CK in and of itself is it is a lot of data to consume. Um, especially when you're trying to map it back to specific threat actors or specific assets. Uh, MITRE actually released, I think it's been a couple years ago, the Attack Navigator. So the Attack Navigator is a web-based tool um, that really allows you to explore and annotate the MITRE ATT&CK framework based on different, uh, different uh, classifications. Um, you can map it based on assets, 
You can map it based on threat actors, based on techniques. You can slice and dice the data a lot of different ways. So that's a lot of words, but let's see what it actually looks like. Um, so attack navigator, uh, you can pull it down and run it locally. There's also a hosted um, version right on MITRE ATT&CK's GitHub page, which is really awesome, assuming you don't have any internal uh, data that you don't want to expose to the internets. Um, but this is what it looks like when you load it up. So if I want to create a new layer in MITRE ATT&CK, I just click New Layer. And this gives me all of the different TTPs that MITRE is currently tracking um, across different threat actors. It's very, very functional. Um, as we can drill in to each of the different TTPs and see the specifics down inside of them. Additionally, this is the really cool part. If we click on the little magnifying glass, MITRE is also tracking the threat groups and not only tracking the threat groups, but their associated TTPs as well. So as I dig into this, I can actually click on threat groups and select the different specific threat groups. And I'll just pick a couple here. And as I select them, you might be able to see stuff start to highlight. So we can see four of these different threat groups the different TTPs that they've been documented to use. And then it makes it very easy to start color coding things um, for different threat groups. Where this became very interesting to me is for our example of our threat actor of China um, and me trying to express to Rob what our coverage is uh, for a uh, state actor or threat actor of China attacking Red Canary. Um, since we've done the legwork of defining the different threat groups that are associated to a threat actor of China, um, not to do it live, we worked through generating models for our different threat actors. So you can see, uh, looking at the MITRE attack navigator we have up on the screen, anything highlighted in red is a TTP that China has been known to use or the different groups associated with China um, against their targets. So that's cool. But like I said, we wanted to push further through that to really understand and answer the question. Okay, we, we have a high level understanding of how the threat actors could attack us, uh, but then we wanted to understand coverage. So um, out of our Red Canary portal, um, we also have the attack navigator spun up and built into the Red Canary platform. So what we have here now is just another tab um, in the attack navigator and anything highlighted in green is a spot or a TTP that just knowing that I have Red Canary deployed um, on the endpoints on our different systems, we have coverage. So you can kind of drill back and forth and see, okay, things in red, potential attacks, things in green, coverage. Attack Navigator lets you take it one step further, um, if not two, and you can do uh, differences based on the different Attack Navigator layers. So I can click on my other layer here. And so what we're seeing here is the actual difference in coverage between uh, what the threat actor of China has been known to do and the coverage based on Red Canary uh, protecting our, our systems. Um, to explain it, anything in red is a TTP that our threat actor of China has been known to use and we do not have coverage for. Anything in yellow is a TTP that Red Canary covers, uh, that, but China does not use that TTP and everything in green is a spot where China has been known to use the TTP and we're covered with Red Canary. And so on the corporate security team, we're able to use this and start to really drill in and look um, 
and prioritize what controls and what gaps we may have. I'm gonna actually skip one thing. Since we've defined our assets as an organization, you can actually work through the platforms tab and you can remove in attack navigator assets in different places that you could be attacked from the model. So for instance, if we didn't have any Linux systems, Mac systems, containers, you should see the model start to shrink down so we can really start to focus. Let's say we don't have Azure AD or network. So now you can see my, my potential attack surface inside of the attack navigator has kind of shrunk um, as we worked through selecting the different assets that China may attack. Um, and then even more interesting to me is not only can we drill in and see, okay, we've got some gaps potentially based on this coverage model. Uh, we might need to look at enhancing our mail filtering for spear phishing, um, uh, drive-by compromise. Uh, maybe we actually, let's say I don't know and I don't understand exactly what drive-by compromise is. I can right click on it. I can go to view tactic. Um, and it will drill me right back across to my other site. And I can see the details on all of the different techniques. And then I can drill in on the security side. And if it's, it's a TTP that I'm unfamiliar with, we can see which threat actors have been using the, the, the attack and when, and then the different uh, potential controls that we, could, we can put in place uh, to mitigate that attack. So that's how we're using it today. So just uh, some high level lessons learned as we wrap up. Uh, and like I said, I'm happy to share any of the research um, that's not specific to our company, the, the big enterprise spreadsheet or enterprise threat model spreadsheet, happy to share it with anybody who's interested. Um, but we did learn some interesting lessons along the way. Uh, as you work through this for any sufficiently sized enterprise, you're gonna have a ton of data, uh, both on the asset management side, on the threat actor side. Uh, think through upfront how to simplify and summarize that data in a meaningful way to your organization. Um, I've learned over my career anywhere I can uh, to lean on very well-defined frameworks. Um, and NIST 830R1 is that. Um, as you start working through the different um, metadata for the different threat actors, um, everything is very well defined in there. Um, so it makes the conversations about the different threat actors a lot easier. And if and when you start using MITRE ATT&CK Navigator, you can export those layers, um, export them and back them up as you update them. Because I believe it's all JavaScript in the browser and it is very easy to accidentally lose them. And that's at this point what we've got. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and launch a poll here for some next steps. So if anyone is interested in starting a dialogue with a Red Canary MDR expert, please let us know via the poll. I'll leave that up for a little bit. Um, Aaron, for anything that you did mention you'd be willing to share, are you okay if I put your email in the chat? Absolutely. Yep. Shoot me an email, hit me up on Twitter, hit me up on LinkedIn. Happy to help. Happy to have a conversation. I find this very enjoyable. Excellent. So with that, we do have some questions. Uh, first one that came in for showing coverage in Attack Navigator. Are there other tools that can be utilized to generate mapping? Absolutely. Um, so the easiest thing for me to dem demo today in Attack Navigator uh, that didn't uh, expose anything proprietary to Red Canary was an export of the attack navigator later from the Red Canary portal. Um, that being said, uh, there are some open source frameworks uh, that will actually allow you to map all of your different logging and detection, detection coverage back to MITRE attack as well. Uh, the detect framework, um, it's out in GitHub is one that comes to mind. Um, and it gives you that you can make that same coverage model for your enterprise based on the different logging uh, and logging sources and controls that you have. 
Um, additionally, some of the other security vendors and SIM vendors um, are also baking uh, MITRE ATT&CK and this type of methodology into their products as well. All right, in an ever evolving threat landscape, how are you keeping the model up to date? That's that's a challenging one. Um, that being said, uh, less just reading Twitter and setting up email rules uh, and reminders to go out and pull the new threat reports and subscribing to things. Um, we have had some success uh, utilizing um, Feedly um, to go out and subscribe to different things for us to monitor different articles based on keywords to monitor Twitter for us. Um, that, that's been my best approach there so far. All right, we've gotten a couple of requests for a short tour of your guitars behind you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, if you ever get to Des Moines, Iowa, uh, when I'm not geeking out on security things or playing video games as you have in the background, uh, I do play guitar in Des Moines' finest disco funk band, um, Funky Town Inc. So if you want to come hear some disco music or some funk music, come on out. It's a good time. <laughs> I thought I, just, I had to put that in there. Um, let's see. I understand that the best way to start is identification of threat groups. Is there, mm -hmm. are there any other ways we can start? Um, so that's part one. Uh, mm -hmm. One is to look into past incidents, but if we don't have that, what should be the best approach? Yep. Personally, I would start with asset identification. Um, the asset identification for your organization is going to be just kind of the linchpin and the key uh, to the entire process. Because as you start to research the threat groups, um, it's going to be very challenging to understand um, if the threat actor is interested in your company without really knowing your vertical, what you do, and then those assets. That being said, um, to figure out the different threat groups themselves, I would look at the big publications that I had in the deck. Um, that's how I approached it. Um, I looked at any, uh, I looked at the Red Canary Threat Report, uh, the Microsoft Annual Threat Report that does attribution back to threat actors, CrowdStrike. I might have to go back in a couple slides and look at the list, but there's lots of resources out there on companies that are doing really good research in Intel and then releasing it to the community for different threat actors. Fantastic. I think that's all the questions. If anyone does have any others, feel free to put them in the chat or Q&A. And again, for those who wanted access to the spreadsheet or any reports, um, Aaron's email is in the chat, so feel free to reach out to him. Um, Rob, I know you were quiet for, for most of the webinar and Aaron did a great job, but any any closing thoughts on, on your end? Nothing for me. Aaron did awesome. He did an awesome <laughs> job with the project and with the presentation both. Nice job, Aaron. Excellent. Well, I am not seeing... Aaron will get a lot of emails now. Well, let's, let's see about that. Awesome. <laughs> not I hope so. Seeing... Yes, not seeing any other questions, so we will wrap up. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. Just a couple reminders before we finish up here. We will send out the recording, so check your inbox either later today, tomorrow, or the following day. Um, and then as you exit, there will be about a 20-second survey. We always appreciate your feedback as we're looking to improve our webinars. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Rob. Awesome presentation. And lastly, if anyone does have questions on content covered in today's webinar, please feel free to email. Aaron, or you can email us at webinars at redcanary.com. Have a great rest of your day.